This is our league, and this is your league. From the 55-yard line on CFL America Radio and the Sports History Network. came in record numbers and filled stadiums across the nation. They came with great expectations and were not to be disappointed. For this was the beginning of a new decade, new rivalries, the first year of the merger between AFL and NFL. But above all, it was professional football, the sport with a flash, dash, and thrills custom made for the new America, the now America. In 1970, pro football had grown so big that it bubbled over to weeknight contests. Sellouts, every one. In 1970, more people watched pro football than ever before. And many of them will long remember that this was the year the game renewed itself. The year when all the elements of excitement came together in perfect amounts to make 1970 that one vintage year. I love a challenge, and uh, if anyone can bring it out of me, then Terry Henry he can. He's a top-notch quarterback. I feel right now that I'm the number one quarterback for Steelers. I don't think there is a number one quarterback. In Pittsburgh, the rivalry between the Terrys, Bradshaw and Hanratty, was a friendly one. But it was rookie Terry Bradshaw who opened the season at quarterback, and he found it tougher than it looked. From the bench, he gained experience as Terry Hanratty took over. But in the end, they alternated, the friendly rivalry unsettled. And in the end, the Steelers were the real winner. A less friendly rivalry in the AFC Central was between Blanton Collier's Browns and Paul Brown's Bengals. The Browns were favored to win the title, and in the early going, they looked good. Their win over the Bengals came as no surprise. But the Browns had breakdowns. They weren't nearly as strong as everyone had thought. And before long, people were looking toward Cincinnati where strange things were on the loose. The Bengals had lost six of their first seven and were considered out of the title picture. But suddenly they regrouped and began to devastate everything in sight. They avenged their earlier loss to Cleveland and before they were finished, the Bengals had won their last seven in a row while becoming the first expansion team to win a division title. So while Cleveland ended the season in mud and misery, the Bengals carried coach Paul Brown into the playoffs. 
In Green Bay, they used to see a lot of defense, and they saw a lot in 1970. But it came from the wrong people. For Bart Starr and the pack, it appears there will be no coming back. Not for a while, anyway. In Chicago, the Bears had a kickoff return man named Cecil Turner, who tied a record by running four kickoffs back for touchdowns. The Bears also had Dick Gordon, and he led the NFC in receiving. But above all, the Bears had Mr. Defense, Dick Butkus. And despite all that, the Bears lacked one thing, and that was a winning record. In Detroit, the Lions showed good balance but defense was their key to victory. And defense got them 10 wins. Although 10 victories was enough to gain them a playoff spot, it wasn't enough to win the NFC Central where the Purple People Beaters from Minnesota were the ultimate in defense. The Vikings allowed only 143 points. Their 12 and two record was the best in the NFL thanks to a defense which scored almost as much as the offense. While the NFC Central was the stronghold of crunch and crush in 1970, there were sounds of thunder heard throughout the league. <laughs> Miracle men of the AFC West resided in Oakland. Chief Wizard, 43-year-old George Blanda. The Raiders were unbeaten in their division, as against San Diego, Blanda kicked the winning field goal with four seconds remaining. Exit Chargers. The Denver Broncos, with a hard-nosed defense and a good offense, won their first three and led the division. Then they met the Raiders and went home victims of shell shock. In Denver, it was George again, when with time almost gone and Oakland trailing, he threw for the winning touchdown. Exit Broncos. And it was the perils of George Blanda again when Oakland trailed the Browns with less than a minute. His pass tied it at 20.
His 52-yard field goal cleared the posts with only three seconds remaining. Oakland 23, Cleveland 20. Against the Jets, the Raiders trailed with one second left when on fourth down, a new cast of Darrell LaMonica to Warren Wells pulled off the greatest of the Raider miracles. And while everyone Oakland met suffered defeat in unbelievable ways, perhaps the Chiefs lost most. They started 1970 as world champions and even led Oakland in their first meeting. But with three seconds to go, George Blanda, who else, kicked a 48-yarder to give the Raiders a tie that amounted to a moral victory. And when the two teams met in the game that decided the AFC West title, the Chiefs played as if they knew they were doomed. Exit Chiefs. Enter Oakland, the miracle working division champions. In the first playoff game, the Raiders faced Miami and relied on their oldest weapon, the bomb. They downed the Dolphins 21 to 14 and headed for the AFC Championship. In New Orleans, the Saints lived up to their name and performed one merit. Tom Dempsey will try to kick the longest field goal in National League history. They're sending him on with two seconds left. Scarpetti will hold. Dempsey will have to kick one 62 yards to win the ball game. Holy daylight, I've seen them all, but this is the most exciting moment in Saint history. Here's a snap, the ball is down. Dempsey kicks, it's on the way! In Los Angeles, the Rams were older, but seemingly tougher. Their defense humbled most opponents, but couldn't contend with the NFL's Cinderella team, San Francisco. After falling under the 49ers' spell, the Rams lost momentum and found one obstacle insurmountable. For in San Francisco, there was a John Brody, a Gene Washington, and a team that found the glass slipper comfortable. For the 49ers, it was their first championship shot, and they cast a wary eye at the thought of losing it. Everyone seemed to try a little harder. year they were tough, but never any tougher than when in a frigid playoff game with the Vikings in Minnesota, they came away with a 17-14 victory. The 49ers then picked up their coach and packed for home and the NFC Championship. In Washington, the Redskins had a runner named Larry Brown. And although he couldn't lead them to a winning season, he himself was a winner as he became the NFL's leading rusher with 1,125 yards.
St. Louis had MacArthur Lane, and behind his powerful style, the Cardinals led in the NFC East. The Cards' defense was also strong with three consecutive shutouts, including a 38 to nothing route of Dallas. But St. Louis didn't win the title because they couldn't beat the Giants. Twice, New York walloped the Cardinals. The Giants themselves had a shot at the title behind the flashing blue shoes of Ron Johnson, who became the first Giant ever to rush for over a thousand yards in a season. Despite Johnson, the Giants weren't able to withstand the late season charge of the Cowboys. In the early going, Dallas was crushed by the Vikings, 54 to 13. They were trampled by St. Louis, 38 to nothing. They had been rated as favorites, but had taken a ride on the chute to nowhere. Then came the light, and Doomsday was everywhere. Coach Tom Landry revamped his offense, and Bob Hayes became the man to catch. Cowboys had yet another prize, and running back Dwayne Thomas gave them a double-barreled offense. And with a great closing spurt, the Cowboys shot right into the playoff picture by winning the NFC East title. Against the Lions, Dallas scored only five points. In the end, five points was all they needed for their defense held Detroit scoreless. Now Dallas was in the NFC Championship at San Francisco. And finally, the Cowboys proved they could win the big one. They powered over the 49ers, became NFC champions, and headed for Miami and Super Bowl V. In Boston, it used to be fun being a quarterback. But then came tough Joe Cap from Minnesota and he changed all that. Win or die trying was his vow. Boston's two and 12 record shows which part of the vow he kept.
which leaves one question. Why would anyone want to be a quarterback in Boston? Perhaps Jim Plunkett knows. In Buffalo, rookie Dennis Shaw became the 13th quarterback in two years, and he was superb. He finished third in the conference in passing. But above all, he was one cool rookie. In 1970, Dennis Shaw proved that, barring injury, Buffalo's quarterback problems are over. In New York, the Jets couldn't bar injury. And of all people, it was Joe Namath who was out for the year with a broken wrist. And so came untested Al Woodall to show what he could do. And he did all right as he led his team to big upsets over the Rams and the Vikings and save the Jets a third place finish. In Miami, new coach Don Shula had Bob Greasy, the scrambling man extraordinary. With Paul Warfield hauling them in, Greasy passed the Dolphins into contention for the title. He could afford to smile. But then his scrambling caught up with him. The Dolphins lost three straight. The smiles were gone. But Bob Greasy came back and led the Dolphins to a 10 and 4 record and a playoff spot, which wasn't bad for a young expansion team. In Baltimore, they had it all a new but knowledgeable coach in Don McCafferty and a rock of Gibraltar defense that broke other teams under a withering rush. But above all else, in Baltimore, they had number 19, John Unitas. And he led the Colts to an 11-2 and 1 record. They won their division going away. In the first playoff game against the Bengals, they had little trouble and won 17 to nothing. Against the Raiders in the AFC Championship, they had a tougher time, but won 27 to 17. And for the Colts, the next stop was Miami and Super Bowl V against Dallas. Both teams had things to prove, and both played a tough game. The winner in the 1970 season's championship was still in doubt, with only nine seconds remaining. And then rookie Jim O'Brien's field goal put an end to 1970. The Baltimore Colts were world champions. And as the final nine seconds clicked off, you fans all over the country looked back on the spectacle that had been 1970. There had been excitement and thrills, incredible plays and unexpected successes. You'd seen the beginnings of new stars and the fading of old ones. You'd seen expansion teams grow up and new rivalries flourish. You'd seen triumph and defeat. 
you'd seen the vast spectrum of the elements of professional football come together in a perfect rainbow blend to make 1970 the greatest year ever. And years from now, when the conversation drifts to football, you'll look back and you'll say to yourself, yes, I remember 1970. And if ever there was one, 1970 was that one vintage year. Thank you.